actually, uh, my dad, you know, being an orthopedic surgeon, he has always told me that uh, since I was very young, he said that you know every one of us, if we're capable, we should try to give back to the society. So, with that concept in mind, I been trying to find ways to actually give back to society, including trying to be a doctor so that I can actually help my patients. Unfortunately, my grades weren't good enough for me to get into medical school, but um, I went and got my MBA at, at Columbia, and then I was able to start accumulating, I guess, some way to uh, give back to society by donating and by starting establishing my own scholarship at various universities, including Stanford and Columbia at the moment. Therefore, I think one of the most influential person would be my, of course, my parents, my dad and my mom. Being who he is, you know, he has always been trying to give back to society in various ways. Uh, I've been taught and brought up under this kind of ideology of giving back. Therefore, I think this is one of the most important things that I really want to pursue. And hopefully I will be able to continue to do so. When I was actually five years old, I, I found this guy lingering outside my house and he, he was shaking involuntarily. So at, at such a young age, I wasn't sure whether he is fine or he needs some medical help. So I actually went to my mom and be like, Mom, you know, there's a guy who's probably dying of disease. Can you give me some money so I can help him? At that young age, the only thing I, I could comprehend was, you know, money means solving issues, right? Money means buying candies, money means getting toys. So I think money, money, actual money could actually help him. So my mom's like, no, just ignore him. Don't worry about it. He's not dying, you know? So, um, um, but I, I was very adamant about it. So she actually gave me like 200 NT, which is about $5 at that time. And then, you know, I went outside trying to give the guy the, the, the money that I got from my mom. But the guy basically just shot me off, be like, no, 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 no. Okay. So after a few years, I, you know, I enjoy writing bicycle so I ride around my house and one day through this door a convenience store I saw the grandfather sh still shaking you know he's still shaking and he was sitting in his chair I was like oh so he's okay so I, I guess my, my father's teaching or belief really affected me since I was five at such a young age the only valuable thing or the thing that can actually help others is was money so I, I tried to take that and use that and then trying to give to another person whom I thought was in need of um, assistance. That would be my first thing ever, that the first thing I ever done uh, in my entire life and I could think of ways that I could help when I wasn't able to try to leverage um, on my mom's financial capabilities uh, to help this, uh, this man. I went to the uh, traditional Taiwanese education until I was fifth grade, I guess the second semester of my fifth grade. And then I went to an international school called Taipei American School in Taiwan. I still remember vividly my English was not good at all. I was really appalled by the fact that we're like dark hair, we're like Chinese, but we can speak perfect English. At that time I was like, oh, I don't like ABC, right? American born Chinese. I feel that they should just speak Chinese. But of course, being an international school, English should be the first language. Of course, there was a little bit of enviness, envying that how can you speak English so well while I I'm like really poor, poorly spoken English and you know I was having such a hard time learning English. So that was why I knew I wasn't good enough so I decided not to work hard on it. After freshman year in high school you know, I was being sent to a boarding school in, in Massachusetts and um, I still remember when my roommate Michael met me you know he asked me hey Paul what's up right but I was thinking to myself what's up so there was a probably like a five second silence and this is really long because if you think about five seconds, if you ask someone a question, you know, they, they stall for five seconds. So after stalling, I answered him, uh, the sky. And then Michael was like, oh, Paul, you're very funny. So I was like, oh, thank you, thank you. So, so that was how bad my, my English was. So imagine having such poor English. Um, I was actually able to get into Johns Hopkins for my undergrad with a psychology major and computer science minor. Um, this was because I was, I, um, I got really lucky and was chosen as the uh, concert master for the uh, Allstate Orchestra in, in Massachusetts. 
that was the first time I realized, wow, the U.S. education system really do look at their students holistically, not only based on their grades. Of course, I did. I, I think I did quite well on my SAT and, and my TOEFL, even though my GPA was like three point. 2.76. It was 2.76, so very low. That was how I got into Johns Hopkins. Apparently, I got into Johns Hopkins due to my extracurricular activities um, by playing the violin. Hopkins was a very, very tough school. It's a wonderful school. However, the culture might be a little bit cutthroat, as you can, I'm pretty sure you can Google it. But I've met my best friend, my long-term friend over there, so it was a marvelous, wonderful experience. However, there was a lot of pre-med, so everyone's pretty, sort of a little bit cutthroat towards each other. Um, so my, my grades become even worse, and that was when I picked up my next passion, car selling. So I, I started selling cars at a rental stand in Maryland, near somewhere near Baltimore, off the you know, turnpike. I can remember I, you know, my organic chemistry lab starts at 8:15. You know, for those of you who's about to attend college or attending colleges, you know, 8:15 is a really, really early class for for college students. I, I could never make it. The organic uh, chemistry lab, I was always late or I just skipped. But when it was time to open up the dealership at 8.30 in the morning, I would be there waiting at 8.10 to 8.15. So that, in hindsight, that proved to me or showed me that how passion is so important. By selling cars my, and not going to school, apparently my grades start to go down and my overall GPA was 2.58 at Johns Hopkins. But because of that experience or unique experience, I was able to get admitted by Columbia Business School. I'm very proud of being, a, uh, you know, being an alumnus. And as you know, it's not the easiest school or easiest business school to get into. So what happened was they actually truly value. I'm a very diversified person per se because most of the applicants probably work at management consulting firms, you know, investment bankers, and all these really, really um, high profile companies. But for me, as a used car sales, I'm pretty sure probably I didn't really have too many competitors per se, because most of the applicants, candidates, would probably be management consultants, iBanking, or all candidates from prestigious corporations such as General Electric, you know, Merrill Lynch, um, you know, all these Apple, etc. So as a used car sales, you know, the perception of used car sales are guys who are a little bit cheesy and guys who are salespeople who are trying to make you buy cars, uh, overpriced used cars. So there are definitely these kind of perception and they're probably not the ones who would apply to business schools, right? So with that being said, I, I actually had that leverage and that edge compared to other applicants and I got accepted. So I think this is, has been a great experience and for those of you, my key takeaway from this story so far is that make sure you find your passion, you identify your passion. Even as a high school kid, elementary school kid, middle school kid, even college, if you're still uncertain what your passion is, try to find it. And how do you find those passion? Easy, you know, just join various programs. You know, go join summer programs, winter programs, volunteering at various corporations or various organizations, trying to find out what actually makes you wake up in the morning and be like, wow, I want to go sell cars. Wow, I want to go play the violin. Wow, I want to play basketball, baseball, anything. You know, every single one of you guys are unique in your own way. So make sure you find your passion. So how, how did I transition to where I am today and what I do? Um, so my passion was, you know, first of all, when I was younger, violin, selling cars. Now, I think this would be my life term, life long term passion would be education. I've always been interested in education. I, when I was in Taiwan for two years uh, before I applied to, to, the, uh, to my MBAs, I, I actually taught at a cramming school or 
I taught TOEFL, GRE, and GMAT. So I really enjoy education in general. And that's why I'm, I'm in the process of getting my you know, doctorate in education um, at Johns Hopkins right now. What happened is, so I started with, I started a, um, a nonprofit hoping to be able to allow students such as myself who have probably was a little bit late identifying their passion. So they, they weren't doing really well in school, but they excel in other areas. So I want these top universities to actually be able to identify these students. So I started working with Harvard uh, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences to run short-term two-week programs, res residential programs, where the executive dean actually taught, personally taught the class of about 20 students. And my job is to identify these students who have high potential, probably don't have the highest grades at the moment, but they definitely have great high potential, high achieving, passionate students who, are, who will be able to absorb and really appreciate the learning processes at these top universities. So how did I start with Harvard? Remember my second passion, selling cars? So when I was in Taiwan, I, I used to call this uh, Mr. Huang, he owns a car company, a car service company, which, you know, airport pickup and drop off company. So one day I was sitting in his car and I told Mr. Huang, hey, Mr. Huang, your um, you know, passenger rear side shock might be leaking oil. And he was like, well, wow, no, Paul, how, how do you know? I am, I will be actually changing my shock right after I drop you off. So I told him this selling car, used car story. And then he's like, you know, one of my customers who this was this MIT guy, professor, and you know, he, he's also really into cars. Would you like to have lunch or dinner with him sometime? And of course, right? So I, I replied, yes, of course. And of course, I didn't think he would actually invite me because it's very random. But probably after a few months, he actually told me, oh, the, the MIT guy is back and he would like to have lunch with you. Is it okay the three of us have lunch? Maybe you guys can talk about business or education, you know, anything like that our cars, and I, of course, I agreed. So I met this MIT guy, and it turned out that he knew the um, executive dean of Harvard or CIS, right, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. So this is how I met up. So after meeting up with uh, the executive dean, we talk about running a program, a, a real genuine program with Harvard, and then we will be responsible for recruitment, and he will be responsible for teaching. And that's how everything started. So we started, the program with only five kids the first year and then I went to Columbia Business School and then they also started an entrepreneurship program with us and then Caltech followed suit, Stanford Medical School, School of, School of Medicine, Berkeley College of Music where I launched the um, entrepreneurship program with uh, Panos Panay, uh, a wonderful guy, Pratt and then um, Brown University. So we have all these seven universities working with us, running short-term programs, allowing me or allowing us, you know, IEG, to really identify students who are still confused about their passion or what they want to do so that we can expose them to different areas of interest in hope that they will be able to find out what they love or what they do not like. So this is how everything started. So again, everything started with a, I would say a driver who owns a airport drop-off pickup company. And I really do appreciate him. And his name is Paul, same first name, Paul Huang, Mr. Huang. So thank you, Mr. Huang. You've made me um, who I am today and thanks to you. I guess there are three things. The, the first thing is giving back to the society. Again, this is what my dad has taught me and this is what I've been living up, trying to live up to. So for those of you, I know you guys are probably still at a younger age, but try to see if what, whether it's the knowledge that you can help teaching. You know, if you're really good at math in high school or college, you know, try to teach others. There are a lot of uh, students or colleagues or younger uh, students in your community who might need your domain expertise in mathematics, in science, in engineering, in you know, computer science. So try to share your wealth of knowledge and learning to others. And for those of you who are probably uh, has 
probably accumulated some wealth, you know, share, share with people who are, who are more uh, in need than, than you guys, than you are, right? So I think helping others is definitely giving back to the society is one of the, uh, the most important thing. The second thing is remember the story with Mr. Huang, the driver who led me to launch my own nonprofit here in the U.S. Um, appreciation, right? Appreciate every single person you've met in your life. There are different people from different walks of life you're gonna be meeting. And I like what Warren Buffett has said, right? Uh, I think the world probably is not operating on a on a system that he believes should be operating at. Uh, meaning that you know nurses and doctors who save lives. Uh, probably are not compensated or well compensated. A lot of the medical staff are not uh, well compensated versus some of these uh, uh, huge you know, financial uh, sector people. Of course, it's just one example, but it's, it's not definite. It's, it's very com complicated. There's various different industries uh, to be involved. But uh, basically, it's, this is one of the, uh, one of the books he, he mentioned. So that appreciate everyone who you've met um, try to see and try to learn and try to grow with them by talking with them. Uh, there are a lot of things to learn. There's always, you're not the smartest guy, you're not the most handsome, beautiful person. There's always someone who's better than you. Just remember that and be humble. You know, appreciate everything, every person you met, every, you know, every teacher who has taught you, uh, your parents and your friends. Right? And then finally, um, you need to be very introspective, meaning that, so identifying your passions, being introspective. If you're not sure what you want, you know, try to spend some time by yourself thinking about what you like and what you don't like to do. And sometimes knowing what not to do or what you don't like is more important than knowing what to do or what you like. In order to actually do that or execute that, uh, you do need to spend some time by yourself and know who you really are. To sum everything up, you know, I, I'm learning new things every day. Um, try to keep an open mind. And again, you know, appreciate everyone you've met, everything you've learned. Trying to give back to society, try to help others in, uh, not, not financially, but knowledge-wise or any way you possibly can. And then, of course, you need to be more introspective and understand yourself understand what you like, what you want, so that you can really excel and then make a difference in this world.